Okay, here uh, we've had a problem here. Can say again, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, we had a problem. We had a pretty large bang associated with the uh, caution and warning there. We we had an accident, and I mean that was a shocker to us when we saw that that one quarter of the spacecraft had blown away. I mean that we had never expected to see that. A long time ago, uh, I was actually in school through the first two years planning to become a journalist. And uh, the Korean War had started and come along and I decided to serve my country and wanted to go in the military. And the program I got into was a Naval Aviation Cadet program, which included flying, uh, which incidentally I'd never been interested in, had never ever even been in an airplane. But at any rate, uh, it was one of these things where the first time I flew, uh, I mean, to me, it was just incredible. I mean, uh, this was just, uh, this was my next career. And somehow involved with airplanes and aviation, uh, that was where I was no longer a journalist. I was headed in a different direction. Wasn't sure exactly where. Uh, and of course, there was no space program at that time. It did not exist. So I uh, ended up, uh, after graduating from flight training uh, uh, into the Marine Corps, Commissioned as a second lieutenant Marine Corps, served in uh, two Marine fighter squadrons, and I was then looking for what next. Or should I stay in the military? And uh, by talking to people, I got interested in reading some books uh, in test flying. I said that would be a good way to make use of the skill I now have uh, to test airplanes. And uh, looking into the background of the people who did it, it was obvious I needed a different kind of degree, not journalism, but an engineering degree. So I went uh, back to school uh, and got a degree in aeronautical engineering. And so I applied in uh, 59 after finishing school and joined the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, which is one of NASA's centers, as a, as a research pilot or test pilot. Uh, I incidentally was following basically in the steps of Neil Armstrong. Neil had started at Lewis and he was kind of two and a half years ahead of me. So he, he had already transferred about the time I joined Lewis to NASA's uh, premier flight test operation at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And uh, then he went in the astronaut program and I just kind of followed. And about uh, three years at Lewis, I worked to transfer to Flight Research Center at Edwards and subsequently into the astronaut program. The first assignment I got uh, uh, both I, I and Ed Mitchell uh, were asked uh, to meet with uh, Jim McDivitt. Uh, Jim McDivitt had a crew assignment as the commander of the mission that was going to first fly the lunar module. First time it was going to fly with humans. And uh, he gave us a very simple instructions. Uh, he told Ed and I, I want you to make sure I have a good limb to fly. And that was it. So Ed and I ended up going off to a uh, Grumman uh, plant in New York on Long Island. And between the two of us, and gave, we gave almost full-time coverage to the, the finished manufacturing and testing of the early lunar modules for seven, I was there seven months out of nine months at the plant uh, involved in uh, vehicle test. Well, that, that was obviously very exciting. Uh, uh, you, have, you have to get a, actually signed to a mission to be s sort of in the lineup where you eventually, you know, you would fly. So I joined uh, the backup crew for Apollo 8 with uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. So Neil, Buzz, and I were the backup on Apollo 8. So that logically put me in a cycle that normally uh, you would fly three missions later, which would be 11. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, or fortunately for Mike, he got well. Uh, and Mike had seniority, so he moved back into the position for 11. He was the command module pilot on Apollo 11, the first landing mission. Well, again, circumstances uh, changed uh, as, it, as it did throughout the program with the, sh the shuffling of schedules 
and what mission you ultimately flew. And as it turned out, uh, Don Isley and uh, Gordon Cooper left the program after that backup assignment at 10. So uh, uh, they signed then uh, Alan Shepard and Stu Rusa with Ed, who had had the one training cycle to fly uh, 13 as the, you know, they were back up, Ed was back up on 10, and they figured uh, Al and Stu needed more training time. So we had, Jim Lovell and Ken and I had already been through a backup assignment, so Jim was asked if he'd move a flight ahead, and he said, sure, why not, we'll fly sooner. So that's how we ended up with 13. Very emotional change, uh, uh, somehow it got twisted in the movie, uh, I was a little upset about that. Uh, Ron Howard made a movie of Apollo 13. And the movie gave an inflection that we were worried about uh, Jack Schweigert replacing Ken Manningly two and a half days before launch. Jack, Jack was the backup command module pilot and that he would be uh, technically uh, not suited uh, and trained to fly the mission, which was absolutely not true. Uh, and those, on those days, unlike shuttle or later programs, the backup crew f flew equally with the prime. Every day we might shift morning and afternoon in the simulators. So you had as much training as the prime crew and you literally could have changed out a crew in the week before launch and it wouldn't have mattered. Uh, the reason being it was so critical to launch when you planned because they wanted the moon in the right spot for the intercept, if we will, in the mission. So you did not want to slip a launch. So that, deliberately that was done that way. So uh, Jack was uh, trained well, uh, quite an expert on the command module <clears throat> because he had been a test pilot for North American Aviation and was working on the early design development of the command module even before he became an astronaut. So uh, Jack was well versed in the vehicle and of course his later training even more so and ready for the mission. Uh, but it was an emotional because uh, the way you, you saw, the, at least my experience, as a backup, <clears throat> as you're approaching uh, closer to launch, maybe in a, a month away, you've, you've done all this work to go fly. You're ready, you think you can go fly the mission, and yet about then you realize that the guy you're backing up probably is going to go fly, and you're not. So you sort of emotionally back away from not being too disappointed. And uh, <clears throat> conversely, the one who's going to fly, that, about that time you realize this is real and it's, I've done all this work and I'm really going to get to go, you, they start getting excited, the one who now really thinks he's going to fly. And so that was a, a, quite a turn of uh, emotions to shift two and a half days before launch. The, the kind of equipment we had, obviously the primary camera was a Hasselblad. We had uh, one that we used in the uh, command module a different one in the limb. It was made with the right uh, things on the front. You could actually work with a, a stiff gloves and a hard spacesuit and make adjustments to uh, f-stops or whatever. Uh, the, the one in the, 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 in the command module was pretty standard, except the one thing they did, uh, they, they had a pack of film you hooked on and they were electric. So on, on my, some of the Hasselblads at that time, I think were manual to move to the next frame or the next picture. Ours where you just push the little button on the front of it and that would automatically cycle in, in that film canister for the next picture. Uh, I would say the launch, uh, except for one incident, was nominal. We lost an engine on the second stage uh, several couple of minutes before it was supposed to, uh, which for, for a few minutes worried us because we thought we may be consuming more fuel to get to orbit that would preclude uh, taking more fuel, particularly out of the third stage, which would also had to be used to leave her. So we, for a little brief time, we were worried we would blown the mission even there from that, from that aspect. But uh, they figured out pretty quickly we had adequate margin and fuel to continue with the mission. And uh, had a one ticklish maneuver, uh, Jack Schweigert actually, at that time had traded places with Jim Lovell and did a, uh, a separation with the command and service module, moved out a few hundred feet, and turned around and came back in to dock. I mean, and that time, I had cameras in the windows. So I had cameras already mounted with the brackets and everything. 
so and also shot some stills as we came back in to dock uh, with the limb that Jack was actually executing. Uh, we extracted the limb and separated it, a little maneuver to separate from the third stage. And uh, that was it for the next two days, it was coasting. We did have some uh, DTOs, or test objectives, uh, it was in, written in our flight plan, you just followed a script. Turned the pages and gave you the time, GET, mission time and what you're supposed to do, when. And we had a set of pictures to shoot as we moved away from the Earth. I'm not sure what the, what the scientists' uh, ideas behind that were, uh, but anyway, at certain intervals, which put mileage, certain mileage away from Earth, we had to point to cameras and shoot pictures of, of the Earth. But that was about the only uh, a thing other than a few snapshots uh, inside the cabin for most of the next two days. Uh, the second day we were actually uh, winding down from what I call a normal work day and we did a TV show. And uh, what we did was, I'll call it like little kids do in school where they bring something to show and tell or talk about. Well, that's basically our TV show was and so that's what we did, I, and Jim Lovell and I staged that from the lunar module. So we were actually down in the lunar module. Jack Swigert was all alone in the command and service module. This is the crew of Apollo 13, we everybody there. Uh, nice evening, and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back for a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. And uh, finally it came to the end of that uh, and we tuned off the TV show. And it was shortly after that, I was now gonna put away equipment we had pulled out of storage. I was putting it back where it belonged. And Jack was uh, all alone up there, had been asked to stir the cryos, which uh, basically is a you know, pretty straightforward, simple thing of throwing a switch. And unfortunately, when he threw that switch, we had, he had the electric short inside the tank, uh, which in pure oxygen is not a good thing to have happen. People call, call it an explosion. In a true sense, it was not an explosion like you think about with shrapnel. Fortunately, oh, I wouldn't be here. It was more just the tank rapidly burning and rapid pressure buildup at some weak point, and we don't know, we never got the tank back. The tank separated. But it separated with enough force and spread into that bay of the service module that it virtually blew off one quarter of the spacecraft. Uh, but it made a lot of bang, a lot of very loud bang, which reverberated through the vehicle. The, these vehicles were metal, both command module and the limb. And so you had that echo of that uh, shock and explosion uh, through the vehicles. There was some vehicle motion uh, not super pronounced, but enough you knew it wasn't normal. Little rocket engines that normally hold your attitude firing, you can hear those. And so we knew something had happened that was not normal uh, by a long shot. Uh, like I said, Jack was the only one alone. He made the call to Mission Control and told them Houston would have had a problem. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. Five guns. Go, guidance. We've had a hardware restart. I don't know what it was. Okay. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main bay bus undervolt. You see an AC bus undervolt there, guidance? Or uh, ECOM? Negative flight. I believe the crew reported it. We got a main B undervolt. We may have had an instrumentation problem flight. Roger. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. Jim had, by that time, drifted up through the tunnel between the two vehicles and got up in the command module, got a headset on. Houston had not, Mission Control had not answered. Uh, and I think that was because the panel when it went by had knocked the high gain antenna. So it not cut us off the comm for a short spell there. And he repeated the call. And from then on, it was just a matter of now chasing this problem. For me, the thing that was obvious, because uh, very shortly I drifted again up through the tunnel, uh, went to my normal position, which is over on the right side in the command module. And when I looked at the instrument panel, 
there were two things. One, a little confusion at a first glance because we had a large number of caution warning lights on, seven of them. You know, you normally thought God wouldn't be so unkind as to give you more than one problem in one system at one time. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Roger, we copy your venting. We figure we've got about 15 minutes worth of power left in the command module, so uh, we want you to start uh, getting over in the limb and getting some power on that. Well, after that, obviously, uh, we, uh, we were on a whole new mission. Uh, and, a whole, and, and our mission plan we had with all of that uh, uh, required photography and uh, things to do, anointed carefully in every page, uh, that book just went in the trash can, so to speak. Jack and I used, and used the cameras uh, randomly, uh, for I'll call it just uh, more as being tourists now. We were sort of along for the ride. The, mis the planned mission was gone. And I knew uh, between the limb and the command module, we had lots and lots of film canisters that we weren't going to use, that we would have obviously used in a normal, normal mission. So we just saw, shot some random stuff that we thought would be interesting. I actually thought uh, also of using the battery powered cine cameras. I also shot uh, some uh, video stuff like zero G. I, I shot one going through the tunnel and had Jack and him. Uh, I was being movie director, had them shoot it as I came out of the tunnel. So I figured that some of this, if we get back, this would be worthwhile for posterity. So uh, that, that's the kind of stuff, uh, how we were using the canners, completely ad-libbed. With the exception of when we got to the point of uh, separating the service module. Uh, from the standpoint of it, we, we had an accident, and obviously you want to document us what you can to try to resolve why the accident, uh, you know, what happened. They wanted pictures of that damaged area. And I mean, that was a shocker to us when we saw that, that one quarter of the spacecraft had blown away. I mean, that we had never expected to see that. So we were shooting pictures pretty rapidly uh, out two different from angles and two different windows uh, of, that, of that damaged area that might be able to tell them more, more about what, what actually happened. After the first uh, maneuver, when we, when we got to the point of powering down the command module completely, which is never planned to be done, incidentally, in flight, uh, we were living off the limb, and Jim asked me when we did the very first uh, maneuver using the decent engine to get us back on the path to go around the moon. See, and when this happened, we were not on a path that we would, we would have got home. Uh, the, that was called a free return. Missions normally had gone on a free return before, that if you did nothing else when you left the Earth, they would loop around the moon and roughly get you back in the direction home. We were not on that path. So it was very critical to get the very first maneuver done that put us around the backside of the moon, started up roughly in a direction to get home. And Jim, asked, Jim Lovell asked me to uh, compute consumables. Consumables being water, electric power, it, it's oxygen, etc. cetera. Uh, the one consumable though I had never thought of was the lithium hydroxide cartridges. And the limb only had a primary and a secondary cartridge. There were spares, but they were down on the descent stage. And normally when you went out on the first EVA, one of the things you'd do is pick those up and bring them back into the cabin. So we couldn't get to our secondary backup cartridges, if you will, spares. So, uh, and they wouldn't, I don't think they'd have lasted anyway. They, they weren't as big as the one in the, in the command module. So people on the ground went to work and figured out using what we had on board, they knew, because they knew from storage list what we had, uh, how to jury rig the square cartridge versus the cylindrical ones in a lunar module to get hooked up to the intake hose on one side of the limb that normally would have been your suit to your suit. And so that would have forced the air to get sucked through the cartridge. And that's virtually what they did using different articles, backs and fronts and checklist, gray tape. We had this, uh, what we used to call armor tape. Uh, to, uh, now you call it duct tape. Uh, but to tape all that up into a plenum, attach the square cartridge hook it up to the hose, and that sucked the air through there. From there on, we just had to tack on another square thing and tape around it, and you could keep stacking them. 
uh, after it's forever, really, because we had a lot of those in the command module. So Jim uh, didn't have a camera at all, but Jack and I were busily uh, snapping pictures of the features. The backside uh, overall is uh, at least the half we saw. It was like a half-lit backside and a half-lit front side of the moon. Uh, it's quite different from the front side. It's not as many of the large, what looks to be relatively flat, darker areas uh, they call Mars or seas. Uh, there weren't as many of those on the backside, at least a half we saw. And so I uh, was you know, shooting pictures of the prominent features. Overall, it's much more rocky, hilly, jumbled craters and smaller ones all over the place. And so we shot lots and lots of pictures as we went by. Now, Farouk Abbas, who is a lunar scientist, he worked more with the command module pilots who were on their, their stay in lunar orbit while we would land. He had a, a much uh, bigger uh, chore, uh, shooting features and sighting features. And Farouk spent a lot more time coaching them to do their job while we were on the, on the ground. And uh, so, but I, I had some lectures from Farouk. And so he, uh, he, after the mission, said some of the pictures we got, particularly was ones of Tsiolkovsky, a uh, large feature on the backside and see of Moscow. He said, they, he said the angle we were at and the altitude were a little higher than flights normally on the backside, about 130 miles versus 60. He said they were the best pictures he had seen of those features. And I really think he was trying to make us feel good. But uh, at any rate, uh, we, had, we had used up a lot of film as Jack and I went around the backside. Now I think Apollo overall in the pictures uh, Tell, uh, tell a story that humans, doesn't matter whether it's us or China or anybody, if they really were geared right and set out to accomplish something that, and at that time, uh, to many seemed impossible, that you can do it. Now obviously you're limited by technology available. Within the limitations of what you have available, you can do some things that you would think were impossible to do. If you get the right impetus, uh, you get the right talent base together with the right management to organize it, uh, you can do incredible things. I had hoped uh, Space Station, which as you know involved not just the U.S., but uh, European Space Agency, which is really a consortium of uh, over a dozen countries, and uh, Canada, and Japanese, Japanese have the experiment module up on the space station. I had hoped that, uh, and the Russians obviously very strongly involved. I had hoped that the space station would have spawned, uh, call it a, a partnership that would have carried forward. In other words, if you could share the resources, because this, the sense of exploration is, is, the, is for all humanity, for the Earth. It's not just for one country or, and so I'd hope that would parlay that kind of partnership that could mutually support and fund a program, programs to continue outward, to do, to do technology work, which we're not doing very much of these days anywhere, uh, to keep, keep exp exploration outward. And obviously the reason is longer, much longer range than any of us sitting here have to worry about. Uh, but the Earth has had four or five major extinctions. And uh, so, you know, it's episodal. So sooner or later, that's coming again. Quite a while, a, a long way, I hope. But it's something that the race, and maybe that's kind of one goal the race ought to have, is to the Creator put us here to survive. Rather than sit around in our closet here on Earth, and wait for the end.